we are all confronted with this question. Who is Jesus? Who is he? The series has been asking that question. Who is Jesus? I've been asked that question a lot in my life. Starting back when I was a kid, my grandma's favorite story to tell about me, I was four years old. We're walking in my grandma's garden together, me and my grandma. She was an amazing gardener and an amazing evangelist. She could talk Jesus into any conversation. And it wasn't weird, it wasn't awkward. It was just so genuine because she just loved Jesus so much and she wanted everybody to know him. So we're walking in her garden and I'm four years old. She's showing me the flowers she's planted that are blooming. It's a beautiful Colorado day. There's bugs crawling around, birds in the air, and she's just marveling at God's creation. And at one point in the conversation, she looks over at me and she goes, oh, Ethan, don't you just love Jesus? Four years old, I turned back to her and I said, no. I think he's a really great guy. That was my answer to her. And as that question kept getting asked in my life, it became more of a haunting question. When I was a teenager, if somebody had asked me, who is Jesus, I would have said, he's the guy that I've let down. As a college party kid who'd walked away from faith, who is Jesus, I probably would have said, he's the guy that's disappointed in me. The guy that I walked away from. Probably doesn't like me, probably doesn't want anything to do with me. If there's a Jesus plan, I have seen myself out of it. After a little more time, I started to really ask the question, like, who is Jesus, though? And what I found was a beautiful thing is that he actually answered the question for me. That I had different answers through my life, but Jesus himself, he actually tells me exactly who he is. And we all have to make a decision about what we believe about who Jesus is, but he is very clear about who he is. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. And today we're gonna look at when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life which is kind of a controversial statement, makes some people squirm. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus says this, I'll give you a little context, it's John chapter 14, and he is at the Last Supper with his disciples. The inner circle, just him and his disciples, it's the Passover dinner, it's a very meaningful night together, and what the disciples don't fully grasp is Jesus is hours away from being arrested. The cross awaits him the next day. And so they've gathered together, he's washed their feet, this incredible act of humility and love, showing them how to treat each other. Judas has left to go betray him. And he starts talking about something that he has told them before. He says, I'm about to go away. I'm about to leave you guys. Jesus has told his disciples a few times, the son of man is gonna be handed over to be killed, but he will rise from the grave. But they can't wrap their minds around that. They can't understand what that could possibly mean. For them, if Jesus dies, this whole kingdom dream dies. They've got this worldly idea, this little kingdom that they have dreamed up, and if Jesus dies, then that whole thing is dead with him. Jesus says, I'm going away from you. I got something I've gotta go do, and Peter, of course, chimes in. He's like, well, I'll go with you. And Jesus is like, no, you won't. You're actually gonna deny me three times. Where you're going right now, only I can go. You can't come with me. And so the disciples are freaking out. They're like, what is he talking about? He can't go away from us. What does this mean for us? They're all panicking. Which is why Jesus says to them, John chapter 14, starting in verse one, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Which I just find amazing. That the guy who's about to be crucified the next day is comforting the guys who are about to abandon him. He's the one bringing the comfort to them. As they're all freaking out. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Well, how can he say that? Well, what he says next, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. It's amazing that in their moment of worldly fear, Jesus speaks to eternal hope. He goes, do not let your hearts be troubled. I've got this. There's a way that I've gotta go make. I've got some work that I've got to go do so I can make a place for you to dwell in my Father's house forever. That's the work that I have in front of me. And the language he's using here is very meaningful to these guys. It's marriage language. It's commitment language. In Hebrew culture, a man, a young man would leave his family and he would go search for a wife. And we, when he found a family and they made the agreement that he was gonna marry the daughter, he would pay a dowry and then he would return back home without her to prepare a place for them to live together, married. He would prepare that place for his wife to come home to and when it was ready, he would go and get her and bring her home. When Steph and I were engaged, I'd been living with uh, Doug and a couple of my buddies, bachelor pad, and then I had this, a couple months in between, 
moving out of that place and when our wedding was. And so I was crashing back with my parents for the final time. And uh, a few days before our wedding, the apartment that Steph and I were gonna move into when we came back from our honeymoon, it opened up a few days early. And so I was so excited to move some furniture in there to prepare the place for when we came home from our honeymoon, that there'd actually be some stuff in there. So I recruited my roommate, my dad, to help me. And we were moving just like a thousand pound kitchen table, couch, we're moving stuff up. Of course, three flights of stairs because of course your first apartment is gonna be a third story apartment, right? That's the only way this works. And so there's all this work to go into preparing the place and I didn't mind at all. I was just so excited, so excited to prepare this place to bring my wife to that we would start our life together in. And my dad was kind of equally excited, I think, because he was like, my youngest son's finally leaving my house once and for all. Like a couple flights of stairs, that's nothing compared to what this journey has been up till now. So let's, let's just do this. So excited, ready to prepare that place. And that analogy falls so short of the work that Jesus went to do to make it possible to prepare a place for you in his father's house. But that's what he's telling the disciples in their worldly fear. I've got an eternal hope for you of what I am going to make possible that you may dwell in my father's house. There's many rooms and I wanna prepare one for you. I like to think that he's preparing a Colorado sports themed room for me in his father's house but I have to go away from you for this to be possible. I've gotta go do something. What it's gonna take is my death and my resurrection and for you to believe in me. Just believe in me, trust me. And then Jesus casually says, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas is like, no, we don't. He said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? I feel like Jesus' whole life was just like living at a press conference. Just hands in the air all the time, just questions, questions. He's just standing probably by himself and somebody just raises their hand. He's like, oh, sorry, do you have a question? I didn't say anything. Like always being asked questions. I was at my buddy's youth group one night. He's a youth pastor and he just came out to start the night and all he said was, hey, welcome to youth. We're so glad you're here. And three hands shot up in the air. And he looked so baffled. He was like, why are there hands up? There shouldn't be hands up right now. There's no, no questions to be asked yet. In fact, that's Jesus' life. Always getting asked these questions and Thomas kind of gets labeled as the doubter because he wants some logical explanation for some things that Jesus says. He's like, dude, you speak in parables. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Where are you going? How can we know the way to go? If you go away from us, where are we supposed to go? Can you tell us? And Jesus says to him some of the most important words ever said. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. How can we know the way? I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known him, you would have known my father also, known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You know the father because you know me. I am the image of the invisible God. I am here to show you who he is and his plan for you. So believe in me as the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me, which is a bold statement. It's a big statement. And I'm not trying to minimize or water that down today. I'm trying to maximize how big of a statement Jesus is making here. To understand what Jesus is truly saying, we gotta start with understanding the difference between the two most basic words that we have, the word the and the word a. Both of these parts of speech, they're called determiners. They point to a subject, but they're different in how they're used. A, when you say a, fill in the blank, is an indefinite article. It is not specific. But when you say the, or in these cases, we will say the even, it's a definite article. It is specific. So for example, last week, I'm in the lobby talking to some people. I see this guy, we say hey to each other, and as he walks away, he goes, hey, you're the man. And I turn back to him and go, no, no, I am a man. <laughs> Probably because it was Easter weekend, it just doesn't feel right to be called the man when you're celebrating the guy who rose from the grave. It's like, no, probably only one guy gets to be called the man. It's why the most annoying fan base in the country is Ohio State. The Buckeyes, because what do they say? The Ohio State University, right? They want you to know this is the only university. Don't, don't wave at me, I'm not cheering for Ohio State. <laughs> they want you to know that we are the only university you need to know about. When it comes to the state of Ohio, this is the university, right? So we understand how we're using this. And I wanna explain that to you because it's very important that we hear what Jesus is actually saying because I think a lot of us hear it but we don't actually hear it. Here's what Jesus does not say. I am a way, I am a truth and I am a life. Jesus very clearly says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, very specific statement. And this makes people squirm. 
But what he's speaking to is the way to salvation and also the way to live your life today. It speaks to salvation and sanctification. To the big picture of what happens beyond this, what eternity looks like, and how you're supposed to live your life today, the way, the truth, and the life. And we hear that, and I think a lot of us, especially in our time and culture, we hear that and we go, yeah, but is Jesus really the only way? Is he the only way? Like, really? The way? The one way? There's a famous fable of an elephant and some blind men who come to encounter and discover what an elephant is. And the first blind man goes up to the elephant and he feels its side and he says, oh, an elephant is like a wall. And then the next man, he comes up to the elephant and he feels its trunk and he says, no, an elephant is like a snake. The next man feels the tusk. He goes, oh, an elephant is sharp. It's like a spear. The next man feels the elephant's leg and says, an elephant is like a tree. The next man feels the elephant's ear and says, it's like a fan. And then the last man feels the elephant's tail and probably says, an elephant smells really bad. <laughs> but he says, an elephant is like a rope. And the way that this story is unpacked when it comes to religion, when it comes to faith, is to say that we're all really just crawling around blind in darkness. And we can only have our own limited perception and understanding and get a little feel for God, whatever's beyond this. But in the end, they all work together and they're all true. So to say that all roads lead up to the same thing, that all religions work to the same thing. And I think we hear that and we're like, man, that's deep, dude. That's good. Let me get another hit. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's powerful. It makes me want to get a tattoo of an elephant. It's so beautiful, dude. It sounds very inclusive and very loving, right? The, there's a couple problems with that mentality. This is universalism. This is the idea that all roads lead, that, every, that there's multiple ways, right? There's a couple problems with this story. And the first one is that no major world religions agree with it. We like to think that Christianity, in our culture, everyone says Christianity is really the only one making that specific claim to be the only way, but every single major world religion actually makes that claim, to be the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And I'm gonna share with you a little information about world religions, and I know that it's like, don't talk about other religions. And I want you to know, I love people of all faiths, respect and love them. I have sat in mosques and talked with imams. I have had dinner in Hindu houses and talked with families. I've been on the grounds of Buddhist temples and talked or tried to talk to Buddhist monks. <laughs> they, they're just silent, so you can't, they're like, stop. I'm doing something here. I have friends of other faiths, I love and respect them, but I do not love and respect all faiths because I have seen the change that they have put on people. But my goal today, hey, if you, are, if you have a faith background of another religion or you're in another religion or a different faith in Christianity today, I'm not here to attack you, I love you. I'm glad you're here. I wanna have a conversation, I wanna invite you. But I mean no offense to the people, but I do wanna speak clearly about the doctrines of what's actually out there because one of my pet peeves about Western culture is that we just cherry pick. We cherry pick the things that, that we like, but we don't actually stay true to what the actual belief is. We Americanize, it's kind of the American way. I'm just gonna make this mean what I want it to mean. And so let me share with you the fact that no major world religion would agree with this, the story of the elephant. They all make an absolute truth claim as the way, the truth and the life. So in Islam, what is said is that it is only by the Islamic way that you make your way to paradise, what God or Allah has. And your salvation is based on your scale of living a good enough Islamic life and tipping the scale, doing enough good to make your way there and to whatever level you are going to get in if you get in to paradise. And it is very clear in the Quran that it is only the Islamic way. Hinduism, real true Hinduism, in those scriptures will tell you that it is only by the Hindu way of appeasing the Hindu gods that you make a good enough karma to be reincarnated, reincarnation. So it's a different way and it's a different destination and it is abundantly clear that it is the Hindu way to Hindu salvation. Buddhism, which we all here are like, yeah, I do some yoga, I've got a little Buddhist statue, he seemed like a super chill, like I like some of the things he said, like that's not Buddhism. Real, actual Buddhism is very clear that it is the Buddhist way is the way to nirvana. It's the only way. How you follow the Noble Eightfold Path, it is only through the Buddhist way. Judaism. The chosen people of God handed God's law and it is up to us to make our righteousness by how we keep that law. And so none of the religions would say, yeah, that's what we're saying is that we all agree with each other, that there's multiple ways. Nobody's saying that. 
Another problem with the story is it's actually diminishing and disrespectful to humanity and to people of faith because what it says is you actually have no idea what you're talking about. There's no way for you to know who God is. Look at these cute blind people just crawling around. They don't know. Like one of those people thinks that an elephant is a spear. Another one of those people thinks that it's a rope and if that elephant sits down, he's gonna be in trouble. And it's supposed to be this tolerant, humble approach but the real problem with that kind of mentality is the pride of the narrator telling the story. Because the narrator is saying, none of you have any idea what you're talking about, you're all blind, but I know what the elephant is. I actually know how this all works. Tim Keller says it like this, how could you possibly know that no religion can see the whole truth unless you yourself have the superior comprehensive knowledge of spiritual reality that you just claimed that none of the religions have? You are making what sounds like a relative truth claim to yourself, but it's an absolute truth claim. So to say, I know better. I actually know how this all works out. And this is kind of the, the mentality, I think, right now in a culture of new age faith, spirituality, vague spirituality, universalism. I, I call it smoothie faith. A year ago, actually, this first weekend of April, I made a smoothie up here to illustrate what I think we do when it comes to concocting our own faith in today's world, kind of like the narrator, to go, I'll take a little bit of this. I like, I like a little Hinduism, not the whole doctrine, but just a little bit, and I'll put a little bit of Buddhism in here, a little Jesus, he seems chill, some of the time. <laughs> Mix that with some of my political and social beliefs, and I'll put some crystals and some astrology and some tarot cards and some sexual spiritual ceremonies and astro all this stuff. I'm gonna blend it together and create my faith. And this is what I'm gonna believe is true. And creating my own absolute truth and ultimately I am God in this narrative. Because I am deciding how this all works but what I have found is I've had so many conversations with people living in the world of spiritu vague spirituality, new age, universalism, people that have come out of it is that it's a constant shape shifting of the truth. There's no actual doctrine to stand on. There's no real true answer for all this or salvation. It continues to get darker and darker and more and more confusing, which is why we need clarity. What's interesting to me about all the different faiths out there is that every single one of them actually answers the question, who is Jesus? Somehow Jesus is the figure that every other faith feels like they have to at least have an answer for who he is. So Jesus is a man and a prophet who is inferior to Muhammad. And there's a, a rejection of his death and resurrection and the power of it. There's actually in the Quran, it says that those who call on him as Messiah, the him born of Mary, they're actually forbidden paradise and thrown to the fire. It's a rejection of Jesus as anything more than a man and a prophet. A Hindu will see Jesus as the incarnation of a God, one of many, many, many gods out there, millions, billions, and you just throw Jesus in as another one of those small G gods. The Buddha sees Jesus simply as an enlightened man. To the Jewish faith, Jesus was a rabbi, but not the Messiah. To someone living smoothie faith, vague spirituality, Jesus is just another ingredient. And even to the atheist, if they're actually gonna stand on history, they're not gonna deny the existence of Jesus, but what they will say is he was a good moral teacher who got blown out of proportion. But everybody answers the question, who is Jesus? And what all of these faiths try to do and what so many of us in our human nature, what we try to do is get Jesus to fit into our narrative. But the problem with the statements that Jesus makes is he does not leave room for that. He doesn't make room for us to fit him into our narrative. Jesus comes in and he says, I'm the only one that can actually tell you who the elephant is because I'm him. I am the image of the invisible God. I have come to show you who your God is and his plan for you and how he feels about you and the, the way that he's making for you. My buddy Trey, for those of you that are tech people, maybe smoothies doesn't quite relate to you as much. For the tech people, my buddy Trey said, it's like we try to treat Jesus like he's an app, but Jesus is the iOS. <laughs> oh, some tech people in the house, let's go. <laughs> we try to treat Jesus like he's an app that we kind of get to fit into our system, but no, 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 Jesus doesn't allow room for that. He says, I am the system that you fit your life into. You come and put your life into my operating system. I think one of the challenges for preachers right now is we feel like over and over and over we are trying to be so clear about who Jesus is. And people hear it and then they go and they put something on Instagram and you're like, that's not what I said. He doesn't fit into your narrative. You don't actually get to call him 
who you think he is. He has made clear who he is and you can reject it, but you cannot call him less than he claimed to be. He does not fit into your system. So let me be very clear with you. Jesus is not an ingredient, he is the drink. Jesus is not a consciousness, he is the Christ. He was not merely a man, he is the Messiah. Not merely a prophet, he is the prince of peace who has come to make peace between you and his father. He was not just an idea, he is Emmanuel, God with us. Not just a concept, he is the king of kings. He's not an app, he's the IOS. He was not just a good guy, he is God in the flesh. Not just another insurance policy to throw on, he is your only way, the way to the abundant eternal life that you want. He is the alpha and he is the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the author and finisher of your faith. He is your atonement. He is the lamb who was slain for your sin. He is your salvation, not a supplement. He is your salvation. He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That is who Jesus is. And this church is not a smoothie bar. And if you're coming from like a spirituality, new age background, great, I'm so glad you're here because what I know about you is you're a genuine person trying to figure out the truth and you're gonna find him here. Whatever your background, whatever you believe right now, I am so glad you are in this place. But I wanna be very clear, this is not a smoothie bar. We serve one thing and one thing only, and it's Jesus. And if you ask the question, who is Jesus? The answer is Lord and nothing less. Nothing less than that. That is who he is. And he will be your teacher and your friend and your rabbi, your guide, he will. But before any of that, he is your savior. He is your Lord and he is your savior and that's who he claimed to be. For a lot of us, I think we give the answer to the question, who is Jesus, kind of like me as a four-year-old. I think he's a really great guy. When Martha came to Jesus mourning because her brother Lazarus was dead, Jesus didn't look at Martha and say, hey, I'm so sorry about your brother, but there's nothing I can do. I'm just a teacher. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Take me to his tomb. When the storm was, was raging and the disciples were freaking out on the boat and they wake Jesus up because he's just taking a nap, his heart was not troubled. They wake Jesus up. They think they're gonna die at sea. Jesus doesn't go, hey guys, I'm... I'm really sorry, there's nothing I can do about this storm. I'm just a really great guy. He quiets that storm with a word. When a demon-possessed man comes and confronts Jesus, he doesn't look at the man and go, guys, there's nothing I can do to free this guy. I'm just a rabbi. The demons themselves call, you are the son of God, and Jesus goes, you're right, and now you gotta go. When people, when crowds are gathering, and they wanna hear Jesus teach, and he can see that they're hungry, he doesn't, look at the loaves and fish and go, hey, there's nothing I can do to feed these people. I'm just a consciousness. When the prisoner on the cross, the man on the cross next to Jesus who is dying, and this man has done nothing to earn salvation. His scale is tipped the wrong way. And he turns to Jesus who's dying on his cross and he goes, hey, will you remember me where you're going? Jesus doesn't look back at that man and go, dude, I'm so sorry, I wish I could. I'm just an idea. I'm just an idea hanging up here. He says, today you will be with me in paradise because I am going to make a way. There was no way, now there will be a way. I'm going to make the way for you. I'm going to prepare a room in my father's house for you, man on the cross next to me, because I'm not just a teacher. I'm not just a prophet. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And when you actually play it out, this is a bold claim. It's the only one that works for you. I don't even have to know you to know that you make a terrible God. I don't have to know you to know that you cannot win the righteousness game. If we have an ounce of humility, some honesty, I can't do enough good works in my life to tip my scale, to outweigh bad thoughts I've thought in a year of my life. I'm not gonna win the righteousness game. This is a bold claim that Jesus makes and it's the most beautiful claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There was no way for you, and he has made the way to his father's house and to abundant life here and today. Tim Keller said, the founders of every major religion said, I'll show you how to find God. But Jesus said, I am God who has come to find you. If God doesn't come get you, you're not going. But he did. He came for you because he loves you. He's got eternal life there and then, yes, and here and now, today. There was no way and now there is a way. Doug and Ryan and I were once in a 
taxi bus park in Kigali, Rwanda. We were trying to get out to uh, an orphanage some friends of ours were at. We had no idea of where to go. We didn't know where, north, south, east, west, didn't speak the language. All we had was the name of the place we were trying to go. So we're kind of walking around, like, pretending like we're going to find it. And finally, this guy, like, is right by us, and we ask him a question, and he's like, oh, I'll help you guys. And we quickly kind of realize, like, I think he just wants us to give him some money. And uh, we tell him, like, this is the name of the place. As we say the name of the place we're going, he gives us that look, like, I have no idea what that is, but I'm going to pretend like I do. Yeah, 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 follow me. So he walks us around, and he eventually leads us to this bus, and he's like, just right here, just get in here. It'll take you. And we're just stupid, so we're like, thank you so much. We just get in the bus. A couple miles down the road, we're looking at each other, starting to get, like, mountainous. And we're like, this is not what was described to us. We ask some people on the bus, hey, we're trying to go here. Are we in the right direction? They just start laughing. They're like, you're going the opposite direction. You're gonna have to get out and get back to that bus park and go the other way. So we had to get out and we found these guys with motorcycles and paid them to drive us back. And when we went back to the bus park, we did not look for that guy again. He had no idea what he was talking about. Meant well, no idea the way that we needed to go. We found this other guy who was so genuine and he was like going to get us there. He was talking to different bus drivers Made sure we got to the right bus. He's talking to the driver, telling him, this is where you need to let them off. This is where they're trying to go. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. We're all good, okay. And we got on that bus and we went to the place we were trying to get to. And as we were talking about it, we weren't all like, well, that was stupid. All the buses should have led us to the place we were trying to go. We were thankful that someone cared enough, to, cared enough to get us on the right bus to the place we were trying to go. And I think for us as Christians in today's world, we are far too okay with people getting on the wrong buses. We are far too okay with people going the wrong direction away from their father's house, away from the love of their savior. And it's in the name of being loving, being tolerant, that we give no clarity. And I'm not like trying to say something prophetic or whatever, I just, we don't have time for that. We think it's unloving to tell somebody crystal clear truth. It's actually the most loving thing you could do if you can get them on a bus to their father's house. And this is how the disciples were. The disciples, they did not pull punches because they had dinner with the guy who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then they watched him conquer death. And they devoted their lives to telling everybody they could, hey, there was no way, but there is now, and his name is Jesus. They get arrested for it, brought before the Sanhedrin. They're threatened, we're gonna kill you if you keep talking about Jesus. And they're like, okay, do what you gotta do, we're not gonna stop talking about him. We're playing with house money anyway. He's already preparing a place for us. We know where we're headed, but with the time left here, we're gonna make sure everybody we can gets on the bus with us. This is what they say, Acts 4.12. Listen to how clear this is. In the face of death, they say, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is the only way. In today's world, to say, I am the truth in a world that wants every truth to be true, whew, that's a bold statement. We want every truth to be true, and it's in the name of tolerance. There's actually a term now, new tolerance. Tolerance used to be that you and I, we can disagree about what we believe, but we can still be friends. But tolerance now is I have to believe what you say is true is true, otherwise it's hateful of me. It's the my truth world. We want everybody's truth to be true, but as we play that out, it is not working. It doesn't work. Like imagine if a guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, my truth is that your wife is actually my wife. <laughs> That's his truth. I'm gonna look at that guy and go, hey, well, unfortunately for you, my truth is that my buddy Keith has been training me in boxing <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna show you some of my favorite combos now. His truth is not true because she's my wife. I have a marriage certificate to prove it. Those two truths are not true at the same time. When you actually play this stuff out, like I've had people tell me, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Like when sin comes up, there's no such thing as right and wrong because if you feel it's true, then it's true. I go, okay, then you gotta play that out to the nth degree. If there's no such thing as right and wrong, then rape, murder, Genocide, racism, 
that's somebody's truth. So you gotta accept it. You gotta sign off on that if everybody's truth is true. But the reality is I think we're smarter than that. I'm not saying we're better than people. I'm saying we're smarter than a reality where every truth is true, where every person's individual broken subjective truth is actually true. I think what's burning in all of us is a desire to find out what is the truth. That's why you're here. There's this beautiful moment where Jesus has been arrested. The Pharisees have delivered him over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman who's in charge in Jerusalem because he has to sign off on the crucifixion. And Jesus is with Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate has status and fame and wealth. He's got a smoothie of Greco-Roman faith. He kind of has everything and he's supposed to be the guy with the answers in town. He gets the final say and he thinks that he has the final say on Jesus' life. And he's trying to like interrogate Jesus and question him, like defend yourself, explain yourself. Because he's uneasy about this. And Jesus has given him nothing. Because Jesus isn't trying to talk his way out of the cross. He knows that he's gotta go there to make a way for you. And there's this moment where he, he says, well, they say you're a king. Tell me about your kingdom. And Jesus looks at him and he says, my kingdom is not of this world but I have come to testify to the truth. And Pilate, this man that's supposed to have all the answers in like a moment of desperation, maybe some humility, he looks at Jesus and he goes, what is truth? Like, I'm not even sure who you are. Can you tell me what truth is? Because I have no idea. I'm supposed to have the answers, I have no idea. And you wanna tap Pilate on the shoulder and go, that the truth, he's standing right there. He's looking you in the eye. He's about to go pay for your sins and conquer death for you. That's the truth, standing there right in front of you. We all have to decide what way will we go? What truth will we believe? Because it will lead you to the life here and forever that you will live. What is your source of truth? What are you going to believe? What are you going to stand on? It could be your truth, your subjective truth. Whose truth are you gonna listen to? Could be Muhammad, Hindu sages, Buddha, your new age friend, a smart atheist on YouTube. You've gotta decide what way will you go? And I know this is a very clear question, a very clear message. It's the most loving thing I feel like I can do for our church is to ask you this question. What way are you gonna go? What truth will you believe? And we have staked our claim on believing the truth of the one who backed it up with resurrection. The one who, the only one who can make the claim to be the life. You only get to claim to be the life if you defeat death. If you can kill death, the powers of it, then you can call yourself the life and he's done it. That's who he is. And he is nothing less than that. He is the death defeating Lord and Savior who backed it all up with his resurrection so that we could have eternal life and live in his father's house. And I know for some people, like we like the smoothie life because it kind of allows us to keep indulging our flesh and doing whatever we want and justifying it because it's our truth. But I think you know deep down that's not working. It's just getting darker and darker and more confusing. I think for some of us, it's like, oh, if I put all my chips in on Jesus, because the claim Jesus is making is me plus nothing. All that other stuff's gotta go, it's just me. I'm all you need, I'm all you want. But if I do that, then Jesus is gonna keep me from some things. And he will. The main things that he wants to keep you from are the power of sin, the power of death, the power of hell, confusion, darkness. Those are the things that Jesus wants to keep you from. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the full. He is your salvation forever and your life today. And if you believe he's less than he claims to be, then you will live a life of less because he's the only one with the more that you are looking for. And this reality, it should change how we live our lives. It should change everything about how we live our lives. John 8, verses 31 and 32, everybody loves this verse. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word, if you believe my truth, then you're my disciples. What do disciples do? They follow the way of their leader. And you will know the truth, and the truth will deliver to you the life you're actually looking for, the life of freedom, a life of hope, of joy, of peace, of love, from your heavenly Father. We've done some basic language lesson, we just do some basic math with what Jesus is saying here. Follow my way, 
Believe my truth and you will live my life. That's what I have come to bring you. And the verse says, everybody loves this part. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Put it on a coffee cup. Notice though, he doesn't say, and you will know a truth and a truth will set you free. He doesn't say, you will know your truth and your truth will set you free. He says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let's cross-reference that with what Jesus said about the truth. How did he define it? As himself. So you could translate this, and you will know Jesus, and Jesus will set you free. The only one that can. Your broken truth will not set you free. Only his. Eugene Peterson put it simply, the Jesus way wedded to the Jesus truth bring about the Jesus life. That's the invitation. John Mark Comer has a new book called Practicing the Way. And it's a really good kind of book about the here and now, like how you live the way, truth, and life of Jesus today. And he makes some really convicting, great points and asks some questions. What he says is there's so much more for us beyond just raising our hand in a service. That's the starting point. But that we are called to re-architect our lives around the way, truth, and life of Jesus. That we have a new operating system. There's a new iOS for us. And if you've had that moment, like that's awesome, where you put your faith in Jesus and you call on the name of the Lord to be saved, but there's so much more for you. Comer paints that with Jesus is walking around, there's really two main groups of people. Really, that's it. There's the disciples, his followers, the people that are following his way and believing his truth and living his life, and then there's the crowds. And ask a convicting question, are you a disciple of Jesus or are you a face in the crowd observing him? He, he said, you know, some faiths, like Catholicism, they will differentiate if they're practicing or not. They actually live out their faith, right? And he asked, should Christians do that now? Do we need to do that? And I don't say that to you to guilt trip you. I say that to invite you. If you're living a life where Jesus is a supplement or an app, or if you're crushed by religion, feeling like the whole righteousness game is on your shoulders, man, I've got good news for you. If you're living in confusion, having a new smoothie every other week, trying to figure this whole thing out, thinking that you have to have the absolute truth, that you're the narrator in the story, man, I've got good news for you. That with abundant clarity, Jesus has come to tell us exactly who God is, and he is a loving God who laid his life down for you to pay for your sin, to make a way where there was no way. So what do we do? Practically, you make his way your way. You make his truth your truth. You make his life your life. It's Jesus plus nothing else. Everything else has gotta go because it's not gonna work. It's not delivering the life you're looking for anyway. It's no longer your way. It's his way that you follow and it's better. It's no longer your truth. It's his truth and his truth is clear. It's no longer your life. It's his life and his life is resurrection. That's what he has for you. And in the here and now, you get to every day follow the way of Jesus. Experience his goodness and his presence in your life in prayer and times of being with him and worship together, living in community and serving in generosity and following the way of Jesus to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbor and to show them, to show them the bus, to show them who Jesus is, the way, the truth and the life, what they're searching for, to treasure his truth, to get, we have his word. I was up at the Murray unit, our, our campus that's in a prison and one of the ladies there, her name's Irma. She's just a leader. She is a boss. She is awesome. I love her so much. And she, we were talking and she was like, I got a new toy. I was like, really? What is it? She's talking about her new Bible. And she literally was describing to me that she gets cute aggression for her Bible. She's like, I just want to squeeze it when I see it. I was like, your Bible? <laughs> the disciple said, Jesus, you and you alone have the words of eternal life. That's what Irma knows. I wanna squeeze this thing because this is everything, this is all the answers I'm looking for. This is the way, this is the truth that I've been searching for. This is the life that I'm called to live. It's right here. Follow his way. Make his way your way. Treasure his truth. Make his truth your truth. Live his resurrected life and share it. So for those of you that you're following the way of Jesus, imperfectly, of course, that's the beautiful part of the story. We're imperfect people pursuing a perfect God, following his way. You're playing with house money from here you know the answer that there is one way and one truth and one life. And you get to spend the rest of your life helping people get on the bus to go to the place in the Father's house that he has prepared for them. We don't have time to be okay with people getting on the wrong bus. It's not unloving to self tell someone the truth. It's actually unloving to withhold it from them in the name of tolerance. For some people in here, I know a ton of people put their faith in Jesus Easter weekend and that's so awesome. I had a feeling there's probably a few people 
that are trickling back. Like, I don't know if I'm ready to call Jesus who he says he is, but I'm interested. I wanna hear more about this guy. I wanna invite you today to call Jesus who he really is. For some of you, maybe you've raised your hand or maybe you've kind of, I believe in God, but you haven't actually started a relationship with Jesus calling him who he is. Maybe you've been trying to get him to fit into your narrative or maybe he's never been a part of your life. And I wanna invite you today to a relationship with Jesus, to follow his way, to stand on his truth and live his life. To the person in here that, man, you feel empty, you're starving on the things of this world, he is the bread of life that will feed you with everything you want and everything you need. To the person that is living in the darkness, he is the light of the world that will bring you out of it. To the person that is searching and searching and searching and looking, looking, where am I supposed to go? He is the door, the clear door to go through. To the person who feels lost, he is your good shepherd who calls you by name to walk by his side, who fights against an enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy from your life and to deliver to you abundant life, who leads you to green pastures and quiet waters. He is not an app, he is not an ingredient, he is so much more, he is so much better. He is Lord, he is Savior, he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and nothing less.